stop talking. Oh. Oh, my the view from here is wonderful. I mean, I you need to stand up here sometime, kind of take a look at what it looks like from up here. Um, your church is well represented at the contact event where we talked about honoring our uh, parents and our mentors and teachers. And I hope that uh, you'll find some occasion when you can kind of, kind of do this in your own church. <clears throat> now, if you listen to the children's sermon, you, you, you know you know what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, <clears throat> the. <clears throat> The church is made up of uh, many different kinds of people. Uh, some are young and some are old. Uh, we come from different generations. Uh, some are Chinese speaking and some are English speaking. Some are very traditional. They think the old ways are best because it took us all this time to perfect it. And then other people think, hey, you know, we're living in the 21st century. We need to be doing something new. Uh, there are differences between generations. Uh, we grew up in a certain kind of environment, so we think a certain way. Our children don't grow up in the same environment. We can't expect them to think the way we do. And so we have all this uh, diversity uh, within our church. And one of the hardest things about being a pastor, it's really nice. I mean, I enjoy being a pastor, but one of the most stressful things about being a pastor is how to get a church that's made up of many different people coming from many different backgrounds, how we can get them sort of marching in the same direction. So what I'd like to do today is just kind of talk about uh, my, own, my own experience in the church and then to talk about uh, why it's important for us to be able to maintain some unity in the midst of diversity because this is one of the ways we witness to the world. Right? We, have pre- we have problems in uh, the Holy Land because we the Palestinians and the Israelis. We have uh, uh, in our country, uh, Obama said, you know, just because we won, we're not going to overpower the opposition. We want to include them. We want to listen to what, they, what they're saying. I, I like that. You know, he, uh, and then the, uh, we have uh, problems in our, in our marriages. Uh, and so learning how to kind of negotiate this is really kind of important. Now, I grew up in a church in the 1940s. And in the 1940s, all the pastors were kind of Chinese speaking. Right? So I'm, I went to Chinese school, but basically uh, the pastor is not wired up the way I am. We never talk to the pastor. The pastor is the principal of the Chinese school. I mean, you think of the, we're American born. You know, we, we, we don't have this kind of uh, relationship with the pastor. He's not one of us. So, uh, in the 1940s, practically all the work among the young people was not done by the Chinese speaking pastor. It was done by either the lay people or missionaries. Right? We're missionaries in the church. They were English speaking. They were kind of running the Sunday school and the youth programs. And so when I went to a seminary in uh, 1951 in Berkeley, the church said, we, we, don't, we need somebody like James Chuck, you know, to kind of watch after the young people. So okay, I became the, the youth minister from uh, 1951 to uh, 1953. I was the youth minister. We had a Chinese-speaking uh, pastor. He, he didn't speak any Ch- English at all. And the, um, uh, he was... A, he was a, uh, and so when I graduated in 1953, I became the English-speaking pastor. Okay, so there's the Chinese-speaking pastor. I became the English-speaking pastor. Because the church is saying, you know, we have lots of young people now. If we don't have an English-speaking pastor, we're going to lose all these young people. We don't want to lose them. Right. So we had an English service upstairs in our fellowship hall. We had about 100 people. 
And then the Chinese pastor, the Chinese service downstairs at the main sanctuary, they had about 100 people. Some people said, we're splitting the church. And in a way, uh, in a way we, we were. I mean, the, we used to be kind of one church worshiping together. Now we're two separate uh, services. And so uh, we had a choir with about 15 people. And then the uh, Chinese service, they had a choir. And they had about 15 people. So after a while, the Chinese speaking pastor left. Uh, he, he received a call from New York to, to start a new church there, and so they were looking for a Chinese-speaking pastor, and they couldn't find one. Okay, this is like 1954. Couldn't find one. So, so they asked me to be the pastor. All right. So I, I knew a little Chinese, not that much, but uh, so they asked me to be the pastor of the whole church. And then when that happened, uh, we we combined into one service again. All right because they say, well, James can speak a little Chinese, we'll preach in English, and then we'll have a little Chinese summary, which I did. Uh, and and uh, it was not that good, but it was passable. Right? So now we have two choirs now, so we, if we combine the, uh, the choirs, the English choir and the Chinese choir, 15 people in each one, how many people should we have? Okay, so you can do the terrific thing. We should have... According to the arithmetic, we should have a 30 people choir. But we didn't because, not because of the math, the math is correct, but because when the two choirs got together, it became too much for some of the people to handle that much diversity. So the, the strong people in both choirs, they were able to sort of come together but the people that couldn't handle this diversity, they kind of dropped off. So for long experience, we learned that uh, people can only handle so much diversity. After that, they just kind of stay away. Right? So when we had our youth groups, and we had, say, young people coming from Hong Kong, and we said, let's try to integrate these people from Hong Kong into our youth groups. And we tried that because we thought everybody should be together, but we can never make it work. For the Chinese-speaking young people, they need Chinese-speaking groups. American-born young people, they need English-speaking groups. It's not, it's, not that, uh, it's not just a language thing. It's like, uh, they don't have the same software. It's, it's not compatible. They, they, uh, <clears throat> and so after a while, uh, nothing much was happening, but in the 1960s, we have a lot of people coming from Hong Kong. So I'm the pastor of the church. I speak a little Chinese, but uh, I'm mostly English speaking. And so we had a big influx of these people into our church. And they, I think, I, I think that, uh, and they came to our church, and, and I think what they were saying to themselves is, this is not like Hong Kong. But doing, in Hong Kong, the pastor doesn't preach every week. I preach every week. In Hong Kong, the pastor preaches maybe twice, and then they have a lot of guest speakers. Now, that was not our custom. And I think that uh, what happened was that a lot of people saw me up there, and basically they were saying, he's not one of us. Right? He's not one of us. So he's not one of us. You know, we can never talk to him. You know, he, he can never be our pastor. We want somebody who's one of us you know, to be our pastor. And so what happened was that in 1977 and into 1978, a group of people decided that they were going to leave the church. And so they, they had a little committee, uh, completely unknown to us. You know, this is all happening. A couple of deacons were involved. Uh, but uh, these were people who sincerely felt that God was leading them to start a new church that was more like their Hong Kong experience. So they met every month, and then the, uh, I knew absolutely nothing about it. Uh, I did not have Secret Service, CIA. <laughs> it, it's, it's amazing that they did that. They, they met like from September, October, November, December, and so on. They met for almost half a year, planning. They were calling up people 
to say, we're, we're planning to start a new church. Do you want to join us? Now, they didn't call my mother because <laughs> it was not likely that my mother would want to join them. But they, So, all this was going on. Uh, the church staff didn't know anything about this. Nobody on the church staff was involved in any of this. <clears throat> and so, on when, one Wednesday, a couple of the uh, deacons said, can we come to the office? We'd like to talk to you. And so they came in the office and sitting there. I remember it was at night. And they said, there's a group of us who are planning to start a new church. And the first service is going to be on Sunday. I mean, this coming Sunday. Right. The next day, they talked to the Chinese-speaking pastor. He didn't know anything about this either. And uh, they told him that there's a group of us that's leaving. On Friday, there's an item in the Chinese newspaper saying that a new church is being started that's going to be in this location on Powell Street in San Francisco. It's going to be called the San Francisco Chinese Baptist Church. All this time, they've been uh, refurbishing a place. They had to call a pastor, and on Sunday, they had the first service. Okay, so one Sunday, we had maybe 160 people in church, you know. The next Sunday, all these, about 50 people were gone. So, uh, I took it kind of personally because I said, look, at, I'm, I felt like uh, if I'm any kind of a pastor, I ought to be able to uh, hold on to all these people. Uh, but this happened so much that if I were to redo that again, I mean, if I could re rerun the tape and redo that again, if I were to do redo this again, and if there were really a group of people who said, we, we feel called to start a new church, I think I, if I were to do it again, I think I would say, how can we help you? Right. Because the thing that I missed the most was that we did not have a service to kind of send them off with our blessing. Now, I know there was no malice a forethought because two weeks later, one of the leaders called me on the phone and said, where do you get your insurance? Okay. <laughs> where does the church get their insurance? So I said, you know, this is not like a group of people had any malice a forethought. I mean, they really felt that God was calling them to do this and that... Uh, and that uh, the best way to do this is not to be haggling back and forth, but just to do it that way. And so, it took me a while to uh, get used to that and to say, you know, of course, no pastor can minister to the needs of everybody. Uh, no single church can minister to the needs of everybody. We're blessed if we can be some things to some people, some of the time. That's why we need other churches. Uh, <clears throat> I'm kind of interested, like there was a group of uh, Presbyterians who tried to start a church down in the South Bay. The denomination gave them uh, money to support a pastor for five years. And after five years, they couldn't get enough people to kind of start their own church to kind of sustain it after the funding stopped. So they, they, they kept going for a while and finally decided that this wasn't enough there to kind of keep the thing going. So after that, these are really committed people, and after that they started looking for churches in the South Bay that they could bring their families to. But most of them couldn't find a church that they felt comfortable. Now imagine that. There's hundreds of churches down there. Hundreds. A lot of them are Chinese churches, a lot of them are not. They couldn't, most of them couldn't find uh, some place where they could fit in. And then because some of their children went to our youth camp and then, you know, they somehow got the parents involved. We inherited most of those people. I mean, uh, we inherited these really gifted, uh, committed uh people, uh, about uh, seven or eight families, and uh, we inherited them because when they came to our church, it just somehow, they, 
basic, this is it. You know, we found it. This is where we belong. This is where we feel comfortable. And, and this is uh, uh, where, where we can serve. So, every church, including yours, you deal with your difference by having a lot of little groups. I mean, at the service. Are the young people still here or are they gone somewhere else? Are they still in the... Okay, you have the children's sermon because you want to include them, right? Because you think, well, when the pastor starts speaking, they're not going to be able to follow it. But it's like, I usually talk to in a fifth grade level. Okay. <laughs> so if there are you know, fifth grade children here, uh, most of them will, I hope, uh, understand what I'm saying. But if not, after the service, I'll explain it to you. And <laughs> you. But anyhow, so, so that's why you have a Chinese service and then you have English service. That's why you have different classes and so on. Most churches deal with diversity by having a lot of little groups. A lot of little groups. And <clears throat> you have problems when you ignore some group. All right? You have problems when there's a group that feels we're being ignored. There's nothing for us. You know, that the leadership doesn't provide for us. That uh, everything is like for, for somebody else. And so, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> we, when Jesus prays, I mean, you say, uh, hey, when Jesus prays, what does, she pray, uh, what does he pray about? Well, in the, in the text today, well, he prayed for the unity of the church. And basically, Jesus is saying to God the Father that uh, I want these people who are so these the people who come from different backgrounds and traditions and so on. I want these people to witness by staying together. By staying together. And uh, one of the songs that we sang early today about that we united in love means that uh, we stay together because we, we think not just about ourselves, but we think about the needs of everybody. And the best that we can, turn up, we try to accommodate the needs of everyone. Now, we can't always do it, but uh, we're, we're conscious of the fact that uh, the church is not just here for us, that uh, we need also to accommodate uh, uh, other people. Now, in every generation, uh, the church is arguing about something. All right, in the early church, there was an argument between the the, the Greek-speaking uh, Christians and the Jewish Christians. Uh, during the Reformation, uh, Martin Luther was arguing about the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, in the uh, in the 1800s. The church was arguing about slavery. Right? Most Christians in the 1800s thought that slavery was acceptable. The Southern the Sun Baptist only about 10 years ago apologized for the fact that uh, they, they were on the wrong side of that issue. Uh, today is homosexuality. Right? Uh, they, uh, in every denomination, uh, that is uh, now some people are split because of that um, but this is what I say I'm not a pastor of a church anymore so I don't feel the pressure but I, I'm thinking now if I were a pastor of a church what would I say and, and I would say I think I would say something like this I would say that uh Every generation, the church is struggling with some issue. That uh, <clears throat> we're not talking about what the Bible says. We know what it says. We're talking about what the Bible means. You know, in our context. I said there are committed, well-informed Christians on both sides of the homosexuality issue. Right? You could say the church is struggling with this. Then I would tell the church what I think. All right. But then I would say, I know that there are some of you who uh, feel differently. So I hope that in the years ahead we can continue this conversation 
But in the meantime, you know, in the meantime, because as a church, in spreading the gospel, we're doing some, something so important that we will not let this Occupy Center stage, and that while we're still struggling with this, we'll not lose the vision that we have a mission to accomplish. I would say something like this. If somebody in the congregation says, I don't think I can respect a pastor that doesn't take a stand on that as if the whole thing were settled, then of course I might be dealing with a person who will either try to get me out of my job or somebody that feels they have to leave. And some of that will happen. But my own hope is that uh, the fact that we have strong convictions of something doesn't make us infallible and that, uh, and that uh, it's okay to say that right now there's a, we're not agree on this, we're struggling with this. And that, uh, and so, I hope that, uh, I hope that uh, we can, can do this in the church. I hope that we can do this in our international conflicts. I hope that we can uh, uh, do this in our marriage. Now, marriage is just an absolutely wonderful place to kind of practice what it's like when there are differences. All right. Marriage is an absolutely a wonderful place. I am working on volume three of Chinatown Stories, and then uh, I just uh, editing one uh, the other day, and, and this is what he said about his marriage. Okay, I thought this was sort of absolutely wonderful. Uh, this is what he said about his marriage. He says, uh, like everybody else, he says, uh, in my marriage I've encountered low ties and high ties and the occasional tsunami. Okay. <laughs> tsunami, is, I, I thought that was just wonderful, the ups and downs, but every now and then we have this huge you know, storm that threatens to kind of overwhelm us. Okay. And then he said, I wanted to marry a smart and intelligent partner, which he did. You know, had a very smart, intelligent wife. He said, what I did realize was I would not get my way most of the time. <laughs> okay. So you marry somebody as smart and intelligent, you're not going to get your way most of the time. And not getting your way most of the time is one of the lessons we have to learn. Why should you get your way most of the time? Right. Why should you? But he says, I also stumble across my most trusted friend, who is a fabulous and caring mother to our children, and a helpful, loving presence to our fam friends and family. When I marry my wife, I would never have dreamed the importance of these attributes or the balance that it has brought to my life. Now, so what I want to leave with you today is that the differences we have in marriage, in the church, in the world. These are not aberrations. I mean, our, our experiences of the past are different and that. This is not an aberration. Every church is like this. My wife used to say, well, I say, Marie, I think I really need to get out of this church because uh, it's just too stressful now. And Marie would say to me, James, no matter where you go, it's going to be like this. So when I was teaching at the seminary, I, I tell the students, when you go to a church and people disagree, I said, this is not an aberration. This is, this is normal. I mean, this is, it is everywhere. It's, it's, the, it's the way things are. I said, that's why we need you there. That's why we need you there, so that amidst all the diversity and the differences, we can nevertheless love each other and get ourselves marching the same, kind of in the same direction without sapping our energy fighting with each other and trying to decide, well, who's in charge of this place anyway? And, and to... And, and to uh, so, differences can be a cause for division or differences can 
be a means by which um, our common life can be enriched and deepened, and uh, where we where we learn that uh, loving each other means not always agreeing on everything, but uh, loving each other means allowing other people uh, to have space to have commitments that are and understandings that are different from ours. But nevertheless, like never occupying center stage because we are, we are called to a higher mission uh, of, of making Christ known. And as a matter of fact, the way we deal with this is one of the main ways we witness. So I would like to say, when people are having problems, I said, why don't you just do what the people in the Methodist Church in Oakland do when they have a problem? Or why don't you do what James and Marie do when they have a problem, right? Now, we haven't got it resolved, but this is a work in progress, but uh, this is what God gives us. And God says, okay, we give you this bunch of people who are members and constituents of the United Methodist Church of Oakland. And God is watching us to see what we will do. God is saying to us, okay, you have these people, you have these differences. I want to see what you do with that. Thank you.